welcome to our class today in religion or in magic, witchcraft, and the occult. Uh, today we're going to be talking about sort of the social function of history, going back and looking at the work of Hubert et Maus. I'm used to saying it in the French, but uh, Hubert and Maus. And we're also going to look a little bit more at what Radcliffe Edmonds is talking about when he describes drawing down the moon. So without further ado, let's get going. There's go. Here's my little point thing. There we go. Um, so we're once again trying to define religion and magic. So why am I constantly coming back to this? Because we sort of tend to almost instinctively want to split religion from magic. Now, I would argue, and this was an essential realization in my own work when I started working with magic in uh, the Sanskrit tantras, is that magic is religion. No, I'm not sure if religion is magic, but magic is definitely religion. You can't separate these things, but you can compare them. And this comparison is really, really important. So this splitting of hairs between magic and religion is valuable. It illuminates both magic and religion. This is what I call a productive and responsible comparison. Responsible comparisons will illuminate both elements that are being compared. Both magic and religion are understood clearer by looking them together. We demonstrate patterns and overlaps between the two, and we suggest something new that we learn about those, those two from looking them together. What we're going to argue today is that magic is about individual agency, and religion is about affirmation of the structure of society. And this will also cluster around a sense of authority. Where do you take your authority from? From the magic book or from the priest? From the teacher of magic, your magic guru, or from your Sunday school teacher? So I would argue that magic is not always against religion per se, but it has a different notion of authority and agency and a different understanding of the individual in many ways. Now, Hubert and Maus and also Durkheim show that the show these different ways in which society is mirrored in religion, that religion is actually a force to maintain society, even to maintain the status quo. Magic, on the other hand, challenges society and it challenges claims of society to legitimate religion. So I'm not saying that right. Magic challenges the argument within society that religion, as we see it, is authoritative and is legitimate. Magic says there's other ways to do these things. And there's ways for individuals to act outside of these groups and institutions that we consider connected to religion, say the Catholic church, Protestant denominations, um, the very sort of what they call the judo, the, uh, the judo Christian, Judeo Christian values of the United States. The only interesting thing there is about the uh, hyphen, because honestly, I don't think any a Jewish person I've ever met would call themselves Judeo-Christians, but I will find a lot of Christians who want to lump themselves in with Christianity. But that's another thing. One thing that's really interesting that I think about magic is there's transgression. There's like a violation. There's a willful breaking of rules. Magic actually claims that the individual, the individual magic actor and the lore of magic, the magical lore, the spells that are designed or are dug out of magic books are actually more powerful than legitimate religion or religion that is sanctioned by society. This argues that there's a different sense of authority, of what is authoritative, and it appeals to individual experiences, innovations of magical practitioners, and magic books. Now, Bernd Otto, who comes up a number of times, he's my pal, we're actually reckoning, working on a book right now, um, gives a summary in the introduction of his edited um, Defining Magic collection that we read out of today. So, uh, so talking about Hubert and Maus regarding Frazier, they say, and they make these critiques of James Frazier, sympathetic rights and beliefs are not restricted to magic as there are sympathetic rights in religion. So Frazier argues that the thing to see uh, to understand magic as opposed to religion is sympathetic rituals or sympathetic sort of technologies and beliefs. Sympathetic meaning like does like. Remember, like I said, if you want two people to hate each other, you put their write their name on a sheet of paper and you put the uh, hair of a cat and the hair of a dog together and then they'll hate each other like cats and dogs. That's sympathetic magic. So 
Like does like. Fraser argues that a sympathetic magic is the main signifier of magic. But Hubert and Maust show that there are also sympathetic practices in official religions, such as animal sacrifices that will increase the life of a community or a person, or a Jewish priest pouring water on a temple space for prosperity, i.e. pouring the water over the altar to bring rain. So those are official actions of a religion. There's other critique is that Fraser's distinction of coercive magical versus submissive religious rites is not satisfactory because religious rites may also constrain. So this is when I was talking about a magical rite coerces a God to do a thing. A prayer or a supplication asks, entreats, and begs a deity to do a thing. But the magical ritual, Fraser argues, forces the deity to do a thing. Now, uh, Hubert and Maus argue that this is kind of not true because within public legitimate religion, we see evidence of people using prayers or votive masses that seem coercive in practice. It's not clear that in practice, these, legit these legitimate religions aren't trying to coerce deities to do certain things. Just listen to any child pray for a school day off in the wintertime. <laughs> All right, Fraser's idea that religion addresses transcendent beings while magic would be mostly mechanistic is misleading because spirits and even gods may be involved in magic. So this is an interesting point. Um, religion, high gods. Magic, little gods. But we don't really see that. When I look through the history of magic, I see, in fact, the Hebrew and Christian God and Christ, the Savior, are commonly found in old Egyptian magic. So there you can see someone using magic and using these supposed high gods. If you look through a lot of contemporary esotericism, you'll see constant uh, invoking of angels and divinities from Judaism and Kabbalah. Now, when I look at the magic tantras, which we'll be looking at in detail later, I see that all sorts of gods are effective. There's not a distinction between gods of magic and gods who aren't in magic. One would think that the god Puroshottama, the highest person, a representative of Vishnu, would not be used because he's not considered violent in any way, but he comes up in all sorts of magic spaces. So when Frazier says magic invokes little gods that aren't legitimate, well, that's just wrong. We find magic that does that. So these are the parts of his def definition that doesn't work. Um, he talks about mechanistic rituals. Well, when I look at magic, I find some rituals are uh, mechanistic as in the sense or mechanical as in the sense that they just work based on saying the thing right and doing the right spell and doing the right thing. They don't have any deities involved. But then just right along the sides of those and lots of magical sources, you'll see um, invocation of a deity or an angel who enlivens the ritual, who makes the ritual powerful. Then the question is, if you call a deity down to give energy to the ritual, does that mean that you've coerced that deity, that you've forced that deity? Or does the deity come because you have entreated it through prayers and offerings? So it's these distinctions are really complicated. So what is magic and who performs magic? So Hubert and Maus has this, have this kind of interesting idea. They say magic is any non-cult thing. When they're saying cult here, they mean any sort of organized system for worshiping of a single deity. So magic is not oriented toward worshiping or offering to a specific deity. Magicians, in fact, are outside the usual authority of priest and disciple. So when you think of magic and you think of what a person does magic who's an authority, you don't think of a priest. You don't think of a pastor. You don't think of a rabbi. Uh, for the case of, say, Hinduism, when we're looking at uh, magic and magic tantras, you're never going to call a temple priest. You're rarely going to contact a Brahmin in any way. There are different types of authorities. And who, what authorities are there? Well, what's an authority and what's a magician? A magician is outside the usual authority of the priest and the organized religion. So in magic, we have officers, actions, and representations. We call a person who accomplishes magical actions a magician, even if he is not a professional. And he, they'll argue elsewhere that the thing that makes you a, ma a magician is that you do magic. Magical representations are those ideas and beliefs which correspond to magical actions. Action. So what he's doing is he's giving you a vocabulary for describing magical rites. Uh, as for these actions, with regard to which we have defined the other elements of magic, we shall call them magic rites. The rites that use magical representations to come to a specific end. 
At this stage, it is important to distinguish between these activities and other social practices with which they might be confused. So magical actions are different from normal actions. To this, I wanna add one thing that I think about a lot. Uh, I didn't make up a slide for this. Is when I think about a magic spell, I like to think of it as an operation, a magical operation. So that requires an operator, an agent, a sorcerer. Then it also requires a target or a victim. So you have the operator and the target. Then you also have other elements that I think are key and important, such as the action, the ritual action, and the result, the wish fulfilling thing, the result of the ritual. So here he's demonstrating that somebody that does magic is a magician. He used magical representations, so items that symbolically represent other things, and he does them in a magical action called a magical rite. Now, when we're talking about the ends of magic, I like to really use this distinction of transcendental and pragmatic, which I brought up before. So magic rites do something. So what is it that they do? Well, a pragmatic end would make a change in the world. Finding a lost object, finding your lost goat, making people hate each other. Stopping disease, healing a person. They're concrete. There's a specific change that a pragmatic thing does, a pragmatic ritual does. A transcendental ritual, again, affirms religion and society. So your profession of faith, your baptisms, your funerals, for that matter. It saves souls. It helps you transition in life cycles. But you'll notice that they're much more general. They're not concrete. They're abstract. What is the thing that comes out of attending and performing Catholic Mass? Well, you celebrate the Mass. So you commune with the divine, but there's not a specific end. So it's transcendent. It transcends this world, whereas the pragmatic is engaged in this world and changes this world. So I found this great quote, um, and it didn't properly connect to what I wanted to argue, but I thought it was important. I'm regularly studying really aggressive, hostile magic rituals. And some people wonder why I read all this aggressive magic. They're like, well, if you look at friendlier magic, then, you know, Maybe you'd come up with nicer solutions. And I'm like, well, the main reason I look at aggressive stuff is because that's what's there. That's what in is in the books. There are so many aggressive rituals. The reason to really look at aggressive rituals is they are so baldly magical. They are pragmatic ritual techniques. We can really see that they are magic and not some loosey-goosey way like we'll talk about in Drawing Down the Moon in a minute. However, there are plenty of instances of aggressive rituals and thoughts in established religion. In established organized religions, it's not like you never see aggressive rituals. I mean, if you go to a fundamentalist church of any kind, Catholic, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, wherever, you will see people in an organized manner doing rituals against their enemies, the horrible infidels, the non-Hindus, the non-Christians, the whatever, even their prayers are asking God to smite them down with mighty vengeance against those infidels. So we get this great little quote here. Uh, on the other hand, rites do exist, which are consistently magical. These are, and they're really stressing this notion of, of a strictly magical thing. There are evil spells or maleficies, and we find them regularly qualified as such by both law and religion. Religion and law call them negative. The casting of a, evil spells is illicit and expressly prohibited and punished. This prohibition marks the formal distinction between magic and religious rites. It is in fact, it is the fact of prohibition itself which gives the spell its magical character. So by calling it bad, by calling it evil, by making it illicit, that gives it more powerful, gives it more power. There are religious rites which are equally maleficent such as certain cases of devotio, the, the imprecations made against a communal enemy, against persons violating tombs or breaking oaths, and all those death rites sanctioned by ritual taboos. So within religion, we do see aggressive ends. So it's not just that magic is aggressive, but it's aggressive in a certain way. I would argue that it's the pragmatic, very one-to-one -one type of aggression. We might go as far to say that there are evil spells, which are evil only in so far as much as people fear them. That's a whole other thought. The fact of their being prohibited provides delimitation for the whole sphere of magical action. And, and a lot of theorists will go back and say this. You can tell it's magic, as Radcliffe Evans will do, by saying it's non-normative. The magic, magic is always illicit. Jay-Z Smith argued this. He's a founder of religious studies. That you will find this magical pole in all cultures. And in all cultures, you'll find elements of society and established orthodoxy that restrict and prohibit them. 
I mean, it's interesting when I look at the magic countries that I look at, because there's just next to no ethical regulations at all. And when I do find uh, prohibitions, they are they're not consistent. They're not universal. They're, that's that's the social world of Indian magic. That's different than, say, this Greco-Roman world that we're looking at with Radcliffe Edmonds. OK, there's also. Yeah. Uh, oh, so <laughs> I forgot a thing. Um, deep within this, this is on page 101, there's an interesting little definition by Grimm that says magic is a kind of religion that is in the lower spheres of domestic life. So I should have had that up on a slide. But think about it this way. If you are looking at the field of religious action, if it's affecting small things in domestic life and the reality around you, it's magic. Religion affects society, the family, like the family as a large whole, the nation, the, the church of the collective body of Christians and whatnot. So again, sphere and, and perspective. Sometimes we can just designate magic as different from religion by the fact that it is used in the lower spheres of domestic life. Okay, authors and actors. Magical rites and religious rites have different actors and officiants. Of a kind, they are really different. The magician performs rituals in far off shrines and wilderness, not in a temple. Magic is done in secret. Even if it's allowed, it's done in secret. And I think about this when I look at all the like locations that people perform magic and the stuff that I read, it's always like, a lonely deserted temple, uh, a tree on uh, on the bank of a river. It's always these lonely, isolated place places. The notion of doing magic is withdrawn from the world. And I would argue from contemporary practitioners um, that magic is often practiced in the home, not in public. I know when I attend Gnostic masses through, um, uh, through a Thalema organization that I attend, we do not do rituals in public. We could. We withdraw and do them in secret. There's an element of secrecy, of being removed from the mass of ritual, or being removed from uh, religious rituals as a whole. The magician is himself or herself set apart. If he acts in public, he is going to dissimulate and cloak his magical actions. There's always a sense of mystery and secrecy. So the magician, if he's practicing in public, is going to do something to throw you off. So you don't see the actual mechanics of the ritual he's doing. He dissimulates. Now, religious acts are different. They're predictable. A mass is a mass is a mass. But magic is often innovative and even transgressive. So when you see magic rituals, they will often have an element, even if they're following a ritual script, of transgressing against ways that religion is usually practiced. Or you'll find innovations. So that those transgressions aren't even like a transgression. It's just like, I'm going to take this religious object and use it in a different way to affect a magical end. So in many ways, what I'm saying is that magic is non-normative. And we'll come back to this at the end of the lecture. Okay. So Hubert and Mouse come to this conclusion. We have thus arrived at a provisionally adequate definition of magical phenomena. Don't worry, we won't always be reading these stuffy old guys from the 19th and early 20th century. A magical right is any right which does not play a part in organized cults. It is private, secret, mysterious, and approaches the limit of a prohibited right. This is key. Magic is not superstructure. It is substructure. Magic is the secret cabal, the group that do things in the shadows. Magic operates outside of the sanction of organized religions. Even when I spend time with like, say, Wicca groups and neo-pagan groups and go and do rituals with them, their rituals are not meant to be publicly consumed. They are at a distance. So one way to distinguish magic from religion is that magic does not involve the organized offering of worship to a sanctioned deity. Now, so magic is almost like a different type of authority. It draws from different sources and different means to authorize it than religions. It doesn't have a Bible. It has multiple tasks. It doesn't have initiated clerics who are like priests. Even if there are priests, the priests have a sort of diffused authority. If you are a priest in a magical order, you'll be considered an authority, but you won't be held in the same sort of esteem, say, a Catholic father would be held among Catholics. 
So a magician, and this is, I think, a key point, is one who does magic. And they make this point that there is no passive or honorary magician. So I think that's really true. Uh, a magician is one who does magic rituals. But this is tricky when you start thinking about contemporary neo-paganism. So when you meet a contemporary witch or a Wiccan, they will regularly say, oh, I'm a Wiccan. Do you do magic? Eh, not so much. One of the big uh, concerns in esoteric communities is there's always somebody that's doing a lot of magic rituals. And like, you, you're not doing magic rituals. What? Why? Why are you even here? And some people would argue you can be a magician without doing magic. But for people who do a lot of magic, you're not a magician unless you do magic. It sounds like a tautology. But I think there's a nuance there where being a magician and being into magic can be a sort of identity in the modern world, which is different from the past. Okay, magic is antisocial in the sense that it is the endeavor of an individual, whereas religion may seek to reaffirm the social structure. What is death and a funeral but a triumph of society and humanity in the church over the ultimate finality of death? It reaffirms society. It's out to, a mass is meant to serve all of the congregants, all of the celebrants there. Magic is different because it aims at an individual. And the ends of that individual are often against the static, status quo. And the authority is different from the mainstream. You have your secret magic books. What's your end? To become superpower, to make people hate each other, to do all of these things that glorify the individual and have the individual manifest their will in the world. But that in many ways is anti-society. It's against the group in mass. Now, will I argue that all individual actions are against society? No, but magic kind of is because you're really saying, I'm going to take this different route than is usually expected for someone to be successful. That route is magic. Not, you know, I don't know. <laughs> if you get magical success through riches, it's not, it's, that's, uh, magic success through riches would be like prosperity to get gold to come to you by a yogini who comes and delivers you a gold coin every night. That's different than going and getting a better job or going to school or whatnot, so you'll make more money. Okay, so um, <clears throat> the magician's power, in fact, sets him aside from society. His power is not social. It's not his social position. He's outside of society. He's a super individual drawing from his or her own work and power rather than the accepted power of society that's re represented in organized religions. Yet, while outside society, he operates upon society. That's the thing. He steps out of society to make society different through his magic to make it better for himself or make it better on behalf of his clients. So... Instead of going to church and asking a priest to pray for your sweetheart to fall in love with you and you get married, instead you go to the sorcerer who is outside of society and says, yeah, screw all that. You don't need to take her on dates and woo her and whatnot. We'll, uh, we'll just do this thing where she'll become so intoxicated with desire that she won't be able to function. She'll have no choice but to, but to marry you and love you. See how that's antisocial? See how that's against the way we usually go around things? But also notice that there is an effect on the real politic of this world. You're trying to get that girl. And you might notice that I often refer to the male space. Uh, I keep talking about he, the sorcerer, the magician as a he. Well, there's a reason for that. And that's that uh, in the pre-modern world, even in the modern world, generally the texts are all written from a male perspective. Stuff has changed. When you look at discourse today, magic is not entirely used by males. Uh, I mean, it's the, the, the gender dynamics of magic have completely shifted. So operators are not always male at this point. But when you read through 98% of texts on magic until the modern and postmodern period, it's always a male. Okay, magic and technology. Think this through. We have said that magic tends to resemble technology as it becomes more individualistic and specialized in the pursuit of its varied aims. Nevertheless, these two series of facts contain more than an external similarity. There is a functional identity since, as we pointed out in our definition, both have the same ends and aims. We will constantly be going back on science, technology, and magic. While religion is directed toward more metaphysical ends and is involved in the creation of idealistic images, so the ideals of religion, maintaining all of society, 
Uh, magic has found a thousand fissure, fissures in the mystical world from whence it draws its forces. It pulls from anything. And magic is continually leaving the world in order to take part in everyday life and play a practical role there. So they find magic finds new sources of power outside of the usual institutions like organized religions. And it pulls from those powers to affect real life. Religion, on the other hand, tends to be abstract. Magic works in the same way as do our techniques, crafts, medicines, chemistry, industry, and so forth. Magic is the domain of pure production, ex nihilo. You don't need anything except the basic ingredients to make stuff happen. You don't have to marshal the whole of the world to get your car built from in a factory with all the ingredients uh, and everything you need. Now you just bit of snake, bit of tail, eye of newt, hog of wart. Hog of wart, what am I talking about? Okay. With words and gestures, it does what techniques achieve by labor. Okay, this is key. By doing a few things in a magic ritual, a magician accomplishes whole scale changes in the world, as opposed to someone who must endeavor their whole life to make a small change in the world. Fortunately, the magical art has not always been characterized by gesticulations into thin air. It has dealt with material things, carried out real experiments, and even made its own discoveries. That is another story that we'll get into. But there's this great argument that comes out of this. Magic seems to do everything when it's doing very little. I asked to kill my enemy. I do a little magic ritual. I did a little thing. It's not going out and killing somebody. It's doing a little thing. But it it, it does a little thing to accomplish a big thing. So there are very, the symbolic acts are, are somewhat small when you really think about them. And when you think about the vast amount of plotting you'd have to do to get a magical end by a non-magical means. All right, the persistence of magic, which we close uh, with Hubert and Maus. Though we may feel ourselves to be very far removed from magic, we're still very much bound up with it. And this key is key. Magic has not gone anywhere. And in fact, we're going to start seeing it everywhere. Our ideas of good and bad luck, of quintessence, which are still familiar to us, are very close to the idea of magic itself. Think about all the good and bad luck, the superstitions, or I would call them magic rituals to make sense of one's place in the world. Neither technology, science, nor the directing principles of our reason are quite free from their original taint. We still think like magicians. You know, there's a thinker named uh, Bruno Latour who says, in reference to the postmodern condition, we've never been modern. We are still just as we has all, have always been. And a lot of biology and biological psychology comes to this conclusion. We have not evolved that much. We have more technology, but we are still the same creatures, you know, writing on cave walls and scratching out, you know, spells to cause victory. Uh, and if you want any indication of that, just listen to the way people act for instance, when like they want to get their kid into a prestigious college, they will go ask any priest. They will go on any pilgrimage. I'm using this as, as kind of a ridiculous example because I see it all the time. As, as I get older, I see people so almost frantic in order to get their children into the best college. And because of that, they start doing weird things. You know, you'd be amazed at the type of magical thinking that will come up. We are not being daring, I think, if we suggest the good part of all those non-positive, mystical, and poetical elements and our notions of force, causation, effect, and substance could be traced back to the old habits of mind in which magic was born and which the human mind is slow to throw off. We still think like magicians. Okay, drawing down the moon. Look at the image here. This is the cover of the book by Radcliffe Edmonds III. You'll notice that he is pulling that you see that there are two figures. They are interacting with the moon. One is pushing it. One is pulling it away. There's a flow of water. There's implements. Yada, 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 yada. Okay. Have you heard of this statement, drawing down the moon before? Well, you might have, especially if you're in the neo-pagan world at all. Uh, the title of this rite, drawing down the moon, and ritual may sound familiar. There's a modern neo-pagan Wicca book uh, by Margot Adler. It's really important, called 1979 or that was written in 1979, that's called Drawing Down the Moon. There, uh, she explains, she explained this in a radio interview. In this ritual, the ritual of Drawing Down the Moon, one of the most serious and beautiful in the modern craft, the priest invokes into the priestess, or depending on your point of view, she evokes from within herself, the goddess or triple goddess, 
symbolized by the phases of the moon. She is known by a thousand names, and among them were those I had used as a child. In some craft rituals, the priestess goes into a trance and speaks. In other traditions, the ritual is a more formal, dramatic dialogue, often of intense beauty, in which, again, the priestess speaks, taking the role of the goddess. In both instances, the priestess functions as the goddess incarnate within the circle. Now, this ritual was inspired by the same materials that Radcliffe Edmonds is perusing in his book on the Greco-Roman world. But Adler is a practitioner. She's a modern practitioner of witchcraft looking to repurpose old rituals to a new practice. This is very common in neo-paganism. I see it all the time. Radcliffe Edmonds is trying to understand the phenomenology and social structures around these works in the Greco-Roman world, though with an eye to make greater claims about the nature of magic. So what is drawing down the moon? <laughs> we read uh, Radcliffe Edmonds, translation from Ovid. She strives with the reluctant moon to hang it down from its course in the skies and makes hide away in shadows the steeds of the sun. She reins the waters in and stays the downwinding stream. She charms life into trees and rocks and moves them from their place. Among sepulchers, a sepulcher is a, um, a, a place that holds a body or a grave in sight. Among sepulchers, she stalks, ungirded, with her hair flowing loose, and gathers from the yet warm funeral pyre the appointed bones. She vows to their doom the absent, fashions the waxen image, and into its wretched heart drives the slender needle and other deeds twere better not to know. So, drawing down the moon, according to Ovid, a, a prominent writer, was scary, a thing done by women, a thing done by women outside of society. And by, by drawing the power of the moon, they could affect changes in the world. Edmonds also tells a story uh, out of Socrates in which uh, someone suggests that a witch could be gathered to draw down the moon and put it in a box. That way, this guy who has too many debts and he has to pay them off by the next moon would never have to pay them off because the moon wouldn't rise again because the moon's in a box. And at that point, they they kind of choke, they kind of joke about the whole thing. The point about this being a joke is that it shows that these rites of drawing down the moon and harnessing the power of the moon were well known and produced anxiety among the Greco-Romans. So Edmonds defines magic in the Greco-Roman world here, which really attends to what we were talking about with you bear a mouse. Magic is a discourse pertaining to non-normative ritualized activity. Non-normative ritualized activity. Focus on that. In which the deviation from the norm, from the normal way of doing things, is most often marked in terms of the perceived efficacy of the act, the familiarity of the performance within the tradition, the ends for which it is performed, and the social location of the performer. So how do we tell that this is a magic act as opposed to a religious act? The type of efficacy, the way that it changes the world, the familiarity of the performance. Is there a tradition of using this type of magic that's known throughout a culture? The ends for which it performed, such as pragmatic as opposed to transcendental ends, or the social location of the performer, i.e. the magician, the one who is outside of society, but affecting society. So keep in mind this notion of non-normative. Non-normative social locations of the performers, women, underclass people, whatever. Uh, non-normative ends. These are not the specific ways that the universe usually works. The weirdness of it all. Just, you know, when you look at a Catholic mass, you go, okay, I can kind of see this. But when you start reading a bunch of uh, magic rituals, the one thing you, you notice is they're, they're weird. They're odd. They're inversions, they're transgressions, they're strange. And one way to really know magic when you see it is to look at its elements of high weirdness that occurs. Um, also, that it has an extreme power. So there's this joke uh, that I told you about, this witch uh, conjuring the, the drawing down the moon in order to get help the guy get away from his debts. Well, here, it's about women. And even if you look back here, Notice how female it is. It shows you the ambivalent position of these female magicians in the discourse. You also notice it's performed in tombs by sepulchers. So there's all sorts of kind of kookiness that comes on. You are doing, magic is weird. So there are rare cases 
in which, uh, blah, 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 hold on. Yeah. So what I want you to do is also think a little bit that drawing down the moon is non-normative. Uh, and when you think about a non-normative thing, you gotta wonder, well, who's non-normative for? So the, the practitioner, someone who practices magic is going to be different from the polemicist, the one who's writing to deny magic's reality or to argue that it is evil. This will tell you a lot of things. I mean, I wonder if when I'm performing rituals that are non-normative, when I do them, they feel normative to me. So what's it non-normative in relation to? And that would be to sort of a mainstream society, the traditions that have been handed down to us. So this overlaps with something I mentioned a few times before is the discourse of inclusion and the discourse of exclusion. So when you're looking at any magic material, you wanna ask yourself, is this being written to say magic is not real or it's bad or it's prohibited? or to say that this is an okay thing that people do. And how can you tell if something is going to be inclusive? Well, usually if someone will refer to themselves as a magician or as a witch, then they are going to self-label. And if they are self-labeling themselves as performing magic, then it will be the discourse of inclusion. All right, what are our takeaways? How are magic and religion differently related to society and social structure? Think about the different ways you see religion operating in a Catholic mass, or a Christian church, or in any time people talk about religion when you meet them in the world, versus how magic is talked about in secret, in a different type of society, inverting society, changing society through non-normal ways. How is magic non-normative? What is the relationship between authority and normativity? Magic is non-normative because it shows a new way to do things, an individual way to do things, an individual's power to do things. And in that, the normal way can be marshaled by the Catholic priest. It can use the normal way to gain power, but the lowly magician cannot. The lowly magician doesn't have the apparatus of the church. The lowly magician has something else, the magic book, the actions done in secret. So this also says, who are the authorities? For the Catholic priest, the church, the Bible, progression of the saints, Jesus Christ, blah, blah, blah. The magician, spell book, effects of rituals in the past, um, prior magicians they have known who have been affected. All right, so what is the advantage of looking at the social position of magic practitioners versus just the mechanics of the ritual? This is where I'm saying, when you start looking at magic, don't just look to see what people do. Look to see which people are doing it. And magic traditionally is practiced by outsiders, by non-mainstream groups. So one would have to argue if one performs a magical act so regularly that it's accepted, then it would probably become normative, even if it's really different from what came before it. So what I want you to just kick around is, who are the people that are doing magic? Why are they doing magic? And how are they doing magic? And what is the social position of those people doing magic? All right, I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye now.